The true origin of vampirism. They come from creatures far different from the modern conception. The Foldry hunters left copious notes on the prevailing theory. The Gothic romantic highly beautiful image stands starkly against their true legacy. The primevals, as depicted in carvings from several different cultures around the world, were monstrous bat-like horrors that also inspired depictions of gargoyles. Pictured here was possibly the last of the breed, which was held in St. George's Keep in the late 1800s. The primeval curse predated modern man, primarily afflicting proto-human species, possibly including the ogre race also held in the dungeon. Eventually humans with deep occult knowledge would attempt to work this curse into a more manageable form to increase their own power. The results seemed to remove the feral madness while maintaining the benefits. But with advanced age, the truth would come out upon their faces, inspiring Count Orlok and others. As the centuries passed, their appearance would swing closer and closer to the primeval origin, possibly eventually shifting entirely. The Haunter subspecies I captured on video appears to be far into this transformation. I know it could happen to even super-powered vampires like the Unmaker, and that Alexandra, the vampire ally of my ancestors, has changed in appearance, possibly in this same way. Wolfmen, the most common form of werewolf, similar in appearance to the common Hollywood conception. Ironically, according to the Holdry writings, they held no true relation to wolves at all. Unlike the creatures today called dogmen and the monstrous Norse demon Voldkin, wolfmen bore a passing resemblance to canines, but these feral beasts were actually the result of a type of demonic possession, specifically by the most ancient, animalistic demons capable of such acts. These demons were set upon their victims by many types of diabolic occultists. This ancient curse would plague the afflicted with a horrifically painful nightly transformation, shifting their bodies into feral nightmares. It was not limited to nights of the full moon. In this state the afflicted would act out in violent rage, passing the curse onto others through their bite. Whoever is bitten by a werewolf and lives becomes a werewolf himself. Harold Oldry considered this one of the more tragic curses, due to longer exposure actually corrupting the human soul within. There was no known cure outside being put down with blessed silver. Voltkin, the most malevolent type of werewolf, in transforming they would literally shed their human skin. They were the only breed to have full control over the gruesome process. They would emerge as the most fearsome, almost demonic wolf creatures known to man. All other known werewolf creatures were the result of curses passed on to the survivors of vicious attacks. Whoever is bitten by a werewolf and lives becomes a werewolf himself. The Voltkin, however, were unique because of their origin's connection to the Norse god Loki and his monstrous son, Fenrir, the horrific giant wolf said to be a god slayer. In the journals of my ancestors, the Voldry line of monster hunters, it is written that Voldkin were like a cult, that new members were initiated and transformed willingly in occult rituals, making them into infernal creatures working to apocalyptic ends. While they had a slight aversion to blessed silver, their divine connection to Loki and Fenrir made them immune to most holy relics with a strong exception for anything related to the god Thor, whose symbols and relics held strong power against them. Be advised, and take demon photographs incoming. Feast your eyes on flesh and blood creatures conjured from hell by occult sorcerers. Stories of such incantations stretch back millennia, and extend into modern pop culture. The lesser beings were called imps. They served their conjurers as obedient subordinates, often acting as servants, guard dogs, or even collaborators, as well as agents to go out and torment selected targets. But most of all grim reminders of their master's ultimate fate. Such diminutive demons are a popular staple of low-budget horror. I'm haunted by the thought of these creatures stalking the shadows of some warlock's den, or even the bushes outside your home. Some could call on more profane horrors still. Full-fledged demons pulled up from the pit and made flesh, some taking the commonly depicted form of a goat-headed satyr, others something even more monstrous and alien. They represent an abominable fusion of all the worst qualities of man, beast, and beyond. 
Perhaps the only thing more terrible than Hell's natives are their offspring with humans. We'll see you again soon. This inhuman entity was once a man that Aldrys wrote of several such occultists, transforming themselves in exchange for knowledge and power, much like the classic tale of Faust and his bargain, also popular in Lovecraftian horror. After decades of devoted occult study, some could hold communion with diabolic entities from other realms. Those traversing deepest into the darkest secrets of the universe, most favored by their masters, could be granted the ultimate reward and sentence. Eternal life is one of the damned. Harold Aldry was the family expert on such creatures, as well as all other demonic entities, with many occult artifacts of his conflicts remaining in the family even to this very day. Take one last good long look into the face of an occultist turned devil. And prepare yourself, we've much to see yet. Sweet dreams. A human-demon hybrid, captured on film, the result of human cultists interbreeding with physical demonic creatures, either born of hell or remade in its image. A popular character archetype in horror fiction across various mediums of pop culture. The truth is closer to its mythological counterparts. Many have suggested the Nephilim, the biblical race of giants said to be the offspring of men and fallen angels. And while the descriptions are not wholly dissimilar, those keeping it made no reference to angelic beings. It strikes me much more like the mythic Cambion, said to be the offspring of humans with any number of demonic entities. A deeper connection comes in its reference in the Malleus Maleficarum, which my ancestor called a mostly abominable book housing a handful of secret truths, such as the horrid beast created in the union of men and other worldly beings. Deep within the thick stone walls of St. George's Keep, the demon hybrid was the most feared creature of all. While most of the other prisoners of the keep were eventually broken into a semi-docile state, the guards tread especially carefully around it, having lost many brothers. From what little I know, this creature was instrumental in the keep's eventual ruin, and may possibly stalk the area to this day. We'll continue soon into another album section, with vastly different creatures. The True Face of a Mermaid once held in St. George's Keep, it was written that these creatures would sometimes hunt people at sea and along the shore. They're described most similar to the Marrow of Irish mythology, who were said to take human mates for the fearsomeness of their own males, described as human women above the waist and sea creatures below. They are perhaps the most similar subspecies to the popular modern conception of the creature, though they could take on monstrous forms as well. The specimen's similarities to the marrow, and their fondness for human males, lines up perfectly with the writings in the journal of my ancestor Harold Oldry, when he wielded the power of the paladin, magical holy knights dating back to Charlemagne. He was sent to slay a ferocious sea monster terrorizing the shore, but after succeeding, nearly drowned in a tidal wave, where he was rescued by grateful mermaids, who had been hunted by the beast as well. Take one last long look at the specimen from St. George's Keep, and wonder with me how many yet remain out there. That's all for tonight, but we'll head back into the Keep soon, as we continue through the Oldry family bestiary. The varied monstrous deep-sea children of Dagon, written of at length in monster hunter Harold Oldry's journal, historically referred to in common circles as sea monks. They are deep-sea monstrosities serving as the foot soldiers of far more horrific entities, with a marked difference in appearance between their deep and shallow water populations. Dagon was a primordial god of the sea, and all life therein, among many ancient cultures. H.P. Lovecraft used the name for one of his horrid deep-sea entities. Leopold, last of the Coldry Hunters, was his contemporary, and believed his work to be based on true knowledge. In his works, Dagon's servants were monstrous humanoid fish creatures referred to as Deep Ones, described with a striking resemblance to the Deep Sea variant. 
while those from shallower waters to me strongly resemble the monster and the creature from the Black Lagoon films. More examples where writers and filmmakers seem to have knowledge of the supernatural. Dagon, the master they serve, has never been seen by man. Though demon-like entities possibly with closer ties to him have, do this creature's eyes seem to be moving? Many viewers on my previous live stream had that impression. Take a look for yourself and see if something lingers within this photo. Purporting to be of an elfish creature reported all throughout Europe. Called by numerous names, such as Bogarts, Hobbs, Hobgoblins, and many more. While generally benign household spirits, their fickle natures often led to terror and violent catastrophe. Most of what my ancestors knew of them came from the witch Bridget that they allied with. This photograph is one of the creatures held for study in St. George's Keep. My ancestors were one of the rare hunter lines that could handle fey-type beings. Within their chest of tools was a container of items specifically meant to combat the malicious among them, including hag stones, a bell, rusted iron hooks, and dried herbs. But their interactions with them were not all negative. Alliances with witches and helpful fey has provided the family with a protection that lasts to this day. Since inheriting the family home I've had several strange interactions. And this tree in the backyard is supposedly a fairy tree, according to old journals and a medium. Take a last good look into the eyes of this creature. Do you see movement in those eyes? Be careful not to call it into your home or an accidental slight could prove fatal. Changelings Horrific creatures that crudely approximate human form, like this one held in St. George's Keep. I've spoken before on the writings about them from my monster hunter ancestors. Many are familiar with the old legends about them replacing small children. But there have long been reports of such creatures in adult forms as well. I believe these entities are the reason for the phenomenon known as the Uncanny Valley. In recent times some have come to believe these creatures are skinwalkers from Navajo legend. But based on indigenous sources this is not the case. Skinwalkers, or as the Navajo call them, Yinaldushi, which translates to with it he goes on all fours, is a type of harmful witch that has the ability to turn into, possess, or disguise themselves as an animal. Changelings, in contrast, are wholly inhuman. My great-grandfather believed the men in black to be these same creatures, and later believed the same of the black-eyed kids phenomenon as well. He greatly feared what they may eventually become. Did a population of proto-humans survive into the 1800s, inspiring the folklore of the monstrous ogre? Large, man-like creatures with a taste for human flesh. To modern men, they would appear as ferocious animalistic monsters. Author J.R.R. Tolkien made no secret that ogre mythology was the prime inspiration for his brutish race of orcs in The Lord of the Rings. Ogres are one of several monsters in the Voldry family bestry I believe could be purely natural creatures that fed on mankind. Held alongside the supernatural in St. George's Keep. The Secret Sons of Man Dungeon of Monsters. Harold Oldry wrote that ogres were reported in several corners of the world, with descriptions much in line with modern understandings of pre-human species like Neanderthal, Denisovan, and others. Larger, stronger, more primitive humans that we now know would eat each other as well as our ancestors. They dealt with their own occult problems as well. Chronicled in detail in the Oldry writings are the original primeval vampires, monstrous precursors to modern vampires reported all over the world, said to be a curse afflicting ancient human-like creatures, which to me lines up perfectly with these ogres. The Tragedy of the Reanimated Possibly mankind's earliest occult obsession, there were many ancient studies dedicated to unlocking the secret to defeat death. This obsession continued through the ages. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Popularly encapsulated in the story by Mary Shelley, it remained a pursuit of real academics well outside the popular works of fiction. And it was in the fusion of these occult and scientific worlds that it was eventually realized. A horrific encounter with the reanimated was central to Harold Oldry's loss of the paladin powers of his forefathers. 
something he never regained. While his own journals make almost no mention of this incident, Sister Helena, the nun that served as his secretary for several years, left behind detailed notes of the accounts he revealed to her in private. It tells of a fiercely dedicated cabal of men studying both cutting-edge sciences and ancient occult secrets. Working these old magics together with technology of the day, they succeeded in creating all kinds of horrific reanimated monstrosities. Yet pictured here is but a tortured early experiment, a horror only to itself.